Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Daniela. Um, I have been actually through the two previews uh, DevOps Days also, and I, it's always an honor to come back. And uh, I always think that it's always a challenge to come here again and again and again, and especially because every time I learned something. So the first time I came here, I learned that I suffer from the imposter syndrome. And then today, <laughs> I actually learned that I'm also privileged and uh, for, in many aspects. And uh, one of my privileges is to have uh, Aspen with me in stage today. It's quite the first time I do this, so it's quite exciting to me and a bit challenging. But maybe you can introduce it. I'm a research scientist in ThinkDev, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I've also learned something today. Uh, I've learned that I, ob I obviously do mansplaining a lot, so I'm also privileged. So I'm hoping to avoid doing too much mansplaining today. So if I do, please arrest me. Um, so at a, as a daily job, I run security and operations uh, for Visma R&D, the uh, SMB unit. But I also do it for enterprise, together with Alexandra and lots of other people. So, uh, and this talk, uh, my, my background, I've been a security manager since I was quite small, I guess. I've been doing security since I was a kid. Uh, and in a long, long time ago, in a life before this, I worked for defense for 11 years. Uh, but my passion has always been in the infosec domain. Hmm. I'm married, I have three kids, and I love sailing. It's short <laughs> about me. I don't have hobbies, so that's uh, <laughs> my life. <laughs> So, um, so what we came to talk today, it's something that we are working for almost three years now, and it's how to make security become a routine in development teams. So that, this is something that we are, we got a research council of Norway gave us a project, and this is what, what we are working with. Then, as always, I always bring some definitions to start with, and then we talk about how to become, how to make security become a, a routine. So the first one is uh, we always like to give our assumptions. And one of the assumptions we have is that DevOps happens in a self-managed team. But then many times I hear when I go around that like self-managed teams don't need managers. Actually, they don't need managers, but they need leaders. And there are different types of strategies that you can have leadership inside of self-managed teams that is going to make these teams more effective. And then sometimes it's shared leadership or it's about like having one leader. Depending on the context, each one is going to be more effective or less effective than others. The, uh, the kind of um, challenge for me uh, when I came here, as, as I mentioned earlier, I was an old army guy. So I was used to having a top-down kind of approach to the world. Uh, but I met these visionaries in Visma, and I figured out that I couldn't do it here. I had to switch everything around. So we'll come more into that later on on the slide. So the second definition that we al I always bring this one is that DevOps also happens in cross-functional teams. And that doesn't mean that you're not going to have specialties. You're still going to have some specialists. And then depending on how you're organizing the task or in organizing the work, that is going to make the team more effective or as less effective as a, a cross-functional team. And then it comes to to our maybe it's our I don't know it's ours anymore, but uh, it's the definition of DevSecOps that is empowered engineering teams taking ownership of how their product performs in production, including security. So. I, I don't like that I have to say including security, because nowadays we should know that quality, security is just part of quality, you know. It's not accepted anymore to have a software out to run in production that was not built security in. So that's the, like, but still we have to say that sec ops, because then trying to be building this awareness towards security. Do you want to say anything about this? No. So, but when we talk about security, it's, uh, I always feel this need to say that it's not only about access control, authentication and authorization, and data privacy. But there are many other aspects that you need to think about security when we are developing a, a system. And that goes to different aspects that sometimes we don't think that is very related to software or the way that we are developing software, but impacts a lot their daily activities and the things that you have addressed when you are putting a new system or creating a new feature and things like that. 
Yes, in, in this sequence, um, one of the things caught my attention. So as you see, prosecution is mentioned up there. I just want to use that as an example of the kind of very uh, high skills that is required by the teams to do this little seemingly mundane task. So for a team to be able to actually do a prosecution, uh, they have to be first able to know that they have been attacked. That is a given. So you have to know the difference between the stable normal state and an anomaly. Uh, the second phase is then to classify the attacker, figuring out was this organized crime, was this a nation state, was this a hacktivist, what was it that, tr uh, that uh, hit us? And then even going deeper and figuring out the actual name behind this. And when you have found the name behind this and the why, you have to figure out what do I do with this? And this is advanced stuff, so then you have to figure out which police department to report to. So if you have an operation in Norway, and you have an operations center somewhere in Europe somewhere, uh, where do you report it to? And this takes time to basically learn how to do this. And this is just one of the points that I would like to make. I, I find that security is, is very much uh, more than just access control, at least. Of course, we still have a lot of problems with authentication and authorization in many systems, but that is another question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so another thing that happened to me during these three last years was that we, we did some research with some companies and we asked it about how they were doing security and so on. And one of the things we fought very strongly was that if no one fights for software security, it doesn't happen because of one of the things that Alexander was saying, like there are different things that you have to think about. There are different resources that you are fighting for. There are different uh, uh, motivations that you have. And one of the main things is to have features out, right? And then, of course, adding security and adding work of security, it adds to the estimation of the, the tasks. It adds more work and it adds sometimes some documentation that developers don't like much to do. But it is something that uh, I believe quite strong that if there is no one that has a clear responsibility for software security, it's not going to happen. You don't have I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Don't say anything else. Okay, so then enough with the, my assumptions about this. Uh, what practically this means? What practically means to have a software security initiative? And then when I started the project, this is how much, as I, uh, how much I knew about it, that engineering, uh, uh, creating a, uh, that's what I thought, that creating a security um, initiative to DevOps it had, we had to go out of this gate perfection thing. It, I knew that it was not going to work with just having a specialist that would come from a specific time or at an, any specific time to see if the security was good. So if we don't build security in since the beginning, it's not going to work. And then that was as much as I was at that time when I met uh, Visma, and then I met Visma. <laughs> then it was like we have all the projects in this pro all the companies in this project, and uh, but then when I started looking at Visma, it was kind of what are they doing? Is this really working? They are so big, and usually I don't like to do research much with super big companies because I like to work with the small companies and medium companies because teamwork is what I like to work with. So then in the beginning I was like, they are ne never going to manage to do this the security without gate perfection. And that was one of the main challenges I saw. But then when I started looking at Visma and uh, seeing how they work and how things work is there, I was like, okay, this makes sense. But uh, does it really work? And then in the beginning, I was quite skeptical. And uh, I was trying to make convince him that I should talk to the teams because I wanted to talk to the teams, but it took almost a year for him to let me talk to the teams. <laughs> and then the day that he said, now you can interview the teams, I was like, yes. But, <laughs> but I still was skeptical. I was still like, maybe all the things that uh, Espen is saying that works and everything is doing and so on is not really true. I have to talk to the developers. And then I talked to them. And then I saw that actually it's really working. It's some of the things we talk afterwards and I say like, okay, this is not working the way that you think it's working, but uh, that's the way that we are developing this research. 
Do you want to say anything about this? Oh, I would say that we have learned a lot from, from working uh, with you over time. So these small corrections based on your, your skills have been able to, to change uh, how we actually do things. Yeah. So, uh, and you've tried to encourage me not to, to change too much, uh, but um, uh, the, the things that you have found has been very, very useful for us. Yes. And then in this process, I also had, I always had a lot of theories in my mind. And then I always, every time that I saw something, I came to him, him with a theory and I say like, does this explain what you do? Because I was always trying to understand and see how to explain what they were doing that was making sense. And that they, the teams were working and started addressing security in the right way. And he was always like, no, this doesn't describe us. <laughs> and then I would come with another one and say like, how about this? Then you can improve in this way. He was like, no, this doesn't work. And then I came to this one. That is not my theory, but it's a theory of effective leadership for self-managing working teams. So the theory says that there are some pillars of, that you have to lead their teams from the outside. So then, for example, the S Pen is an outsider to the development teams. But then how to create this leadership that is going to make effective to, to do security work. So then the pillars are relating, scouting, persuading and empowering. Empowering to me was the first thing. All the models that I came to him was almost always about the empowering part. And I think that he always felt like, no, it's missing. There are more things here. There are this and this and that that I do. And then, uh, so then it's, uh, and we are going to talk about this and how Visma has implemented this for the security program. And then how they are working on this in the different roles. So as that thing that I said before, clear, clear responsibilities are very important in this uh, process. And also it was what you came up with us. Yeah. From my comment, it's just I, I agree. Uh, she showed me lots of different models. And this one made sense, at least to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, um, she's asked me how we do it in practice. I will come a bit uh, later to that, uh, just to tell you the, the steps that we, we followed try to create this. Yeah. So then, first, the team configuration in Visma. <laughs> yeah, very simplified view. Uh, the, this is uh, a construction where I put myself on the bottom, and she insisted on putting a picture of me here, so but that's of course. <laughs> the kind of general idea of this is that I play on the same team as, as my colleagues in Sweden, Romania, and, and uh, Lithuania, uh, and all of the security engineers they are the ones who make decisions. So I don't make decisions on their behalf, they make the decisions. And this is kind of the core of the VCDM model that Alexander explained earlier. So one of the fundamental things that we do here is that all decisions are made on team level. They are not made by me or the other security specialists. We are just here to assist them. So therefore they are on top of the pyramid, we are on the bottom. It's our job to facilitate their work. Yeah, another thing that I was quite impressed about this model was like, how can they be just nine people and 110 teams? I don't know. That was what also puzzled me about this. And then, uh, so then that's why I, I had to study to try to explain this. And also another thing that we are doing is try to see if this would fit to a small company and how this would fit to a small company. And actually it fits, of course, like small companies we do not be able to have nine people in the team. Some of the things when we go to a smaller company, we have to compromise. And uh, not everything that Visma is doing, we are able to do. And then sometimes we do some things in the smaller scale that they, they don't manage to scale up. And that is one of the challenges that sometimes we, we have on working on this action research. So the first role that uh, it is, is Aspen's role. Yeah. <laughs> that is the security manager and officer. And then I tried to see like, what is really that he does in the daily life? We were talking like every other week, and then I observed many of the activities that they were doing and so on. And then I saw that he was very much doing this political awareness, you know, inside of Visma, understanding of like how things work and how the system works and what are the demands from customers, what are the demands from, from the organization and what's the demands also from the teams. So that's the part of the scouting of it, that you go and seek and find information about it. And then he did a lot of persuading, looking at the external support, so then he could build a uh, program that 
the, the teams didn't have to, for example, pay for each one of the tools that they would use and things like that. Should I go to the next one? Or yeah, to I can. But then he added things. <laughs> <laughs> no, in um, the kind of beginning of this, because we came from one place and we were quite uh, stimulated and motivated by the work done by the DCDM teams. So we quite soon figured out that that was obviously the way to go. So we tried to latch on and just jump on the train and then follow, follow these guys because they were obviously leading a way into a future that, that was doable for most. So we tried to create an overall strategy for security that basically was aligned with that. So we spread that out to all teams uh, in PU and also in the rest of enterprise, basically comprising the bulk of the Vesma security or development teams. And so when we created the overall strategy that was based on a different uh, understanding of the world. So I'll try to um, show you the kind of travel. So the, to create such a, an overall strategy just requires some kind of initial metrics. We use the open SAM methodology. It's from OVASP. You can use a BSIM or whatever kind of metrics that you like and you feel familiar with. So we started with that one, trying to figure out where were we. And based on that, we also did an extensive study on the organizational structure of Visma. And that is where people like Alexander popped up. So as I mentioned, I am an ex-military guy. So normally I would be in love with a top-down approach. And I was in the beginning. My actual plan first was just to get this certified according to some strategy, translate everything in my picture, and then rule them all. So, but that, that doesn't work in Visma. So I just had to change the entire approach. What we understood quite fast is that the red line on top, this is top-down. This is management approach. You make rules, you make policies. And the teams uh, in the middle, this kind of Pointer cannot point up there, but there is teams in the middle there. And they have to choose suddenly. So they get the rules from top. But then you have the innovators, you have these extremely skilled people that comes in uh, with the, the, um, the experience from the world with them. Uh, people like Alexander, developers, um, architects, all layers of this intelligentsia in, inside the company. So they actually make most sense for it. So what we found out quite fast is that these people they own a more realistic version of the truth than the ones on top. So we basically saw that all the teams had to choose between current advice from, from academia, from uh, other companies, from their own experience, and some ar archaic rules that took six months to change. So every time a team asked me, because in the beginning they asked me for advice, asked me to make decisions for them. So I told them, okay, what makes sense? Just follow the guys on the bottom. Don't follow the guys on top because these rules are too old. Just have to try to experiment with that. So based on that, we made a, a system uh, where all of these swim lanes, it's too small to read, but all of these swim lane represents uh, one approach towards each of the levels of, of the company, from developers, architects, QAs, uh, managers, top leaders, board level. So all of that is part of building the program. How do you affect the, the behavioral patterns of all of these? So we have freshened it up a bit, and it looks like that in the end. So basically, it became a security program that comprised most of the things we would need in a DevOps setting. But the fundamental thing in this, for us, became the transfer of power. How do we transfer power from top level to development teams? Because if you don't own the context, you cannot make decisions. And this was a profound experience, and I will tell more about that, uh, and a couple of slides later, I will come to um, uh, how we do inline uh, checking of source code, how we do inline checking of um, security and third-party components. So for me to avoid the temptation of making decisions on all this behalf, that was a very tough fight for myself. I have to make sure the decisions are still made on team level by the ones with the contextual knowledge, as opposed to making decisions myself. Yes, and then if you think like, does this work in a small company? I think so. So what we are doing, I'm doing now in, in uh, Trondheim. I'm working as a security officer in a small company, and then I try to use many of the things that I learned in Visma to see if I can scale down and it works still in, 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 in Clara. So Fara is a company that has 50 developers, and we have five teams, and I'm the security officer. You know, so then I'm trying to build up with the same way of thinking that is empowering the teams in a different way. Of course, there we don't have the whole security team that uh, Aspen has. <laughs> and, uh, and like Aspen said, one of the main 
roles of the security team that Aspen has is this building development team trust about security and that they are addressing security in the right way and also delegating the authority and um, flexi giving flexibility to the team decisions and coaching them. So this giving flexibility of the, uh, regarding the, the team decisions are things like, for example, if a vulnerability is found, then they are not going to say to the team, okay, this is the way that you have to do, you have to do tomorrow, you have to do this way, and so on. They just say like, okay, we found this, for example, when they do some manual security testing, and then the team decides how they are going to do. So if they say like, you're going to use the static analysis tools, then they decide which tools is going to be used, but the team decides what's going to be the process around that. So this is a way to empower them to do things. Yes. And then one of the things that uh, they do quite a lot is this monitoring of the success of the program, whatever it is uh, decided to do. That, so then monitoring to see if it's not only the onboarding of the security, but the continuity of using and addressing security in the right way. Um, this one is just a simple slide that exemplifies um, um, the kind of overall program itself. This is. Some people say it looks like something else than a snake, but I will refrain from that. It's a snake <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the eyes of the UX people. So this is a snake. Uh, but what we do, we have, as also Alexander mentioned, we have these gap analysis. The security self-assessment is very central. Uh, if you really read through it with fine comb, you can find traces from all OpenSAM and BSIM inside it. You'll find OVS top 10 covered. You'll find all the normal things that you would need to ask yourself in, in the AppSec domain. So I do AppSec. I don't do the network security thing. So in this is how we basically show our quality system to the auditors. So behind each of these little uh, padlocks, there is a process that is aligned with 27001. So, but the developers don't need to work on 27001 because that's boring and it doesn't work. So that's for me to do in the background. Yeah. So it's for, for compliance reasons. Yeah, this self-assessment to me, in the beginning, I said to husband that I didn't really believe in it because it was very extensive and uh, it is quite extensive. It's asking a lot of things about the security profile of the, of the product. And then I thought it was just killing and that the, the, no one would do. But then when I went to talk to the developers and ask them how this works and how, how good was it and how beneficial was it and so on, they said it was very good to create awareness in the whole team about the different problems with security or to find out some of the points or where they were weak and where they were strong and so on. So they use it as a tool also to do training and coaching, and then afterwards also one person from the security team comes and discuss the results. In these self-assessments, they have the threat modeling also as part of the activity, and uh, as part of the continuity, the, you have to run every year, right? Yes, we have. So every year you have to run this, and actually this is something that I would recommend, and like um, uh, Aspen said, you can start with something very general to see the gap analysis of how it's your security program. But you can also be very specific about like how do you handle input validation, what is your threat model, and what are you doing with, are you handling exceptions in the right way, are you doing anything with uh, web and things like that. So, um, yeah. So this is one tool that I thought it was quite uh, good to use. And as if you see the security training also, it's another part that is very important when you think about coaching. Everyone needs to be more aware of the different things and uh, using different strategies for training, not only like classroom type of training, but also training towards, for example, the self-assessment. Yeah, I would like to emphasize that actually. I'm happy you reminded me because one of the kind of key elements in the training aspects here is to give it contextually. So all security training needs to be delivered in context of the team. So, and the only way to do that is to actually understand the context of the team. And that is a, it's a really difficult job if you're not a developer yourself. So what we did uh, was to try to implement all of these um, methodologies that I will describe later as part of the context in the team. Like the security self-assessment, it is done exclusively in the context of the team. All discussions are made for that one product. That is also part of a training, because when you go through this, uh, we coach it. It's our job as security professionals to coach them there. Uh, they get trained on these items. When we do the manual security test up there, 
basically our hackers in Vilnius who hack applications for, yeah, for, I, I pay them at least to do that, so I assume that's what they do. But I, I've been told that they're very good at what they do, and I'm proud of them. So all of these tests, they have a manual uh, handover component in it where they train the teams in what did I find and how did I find it? How does this stack up against your own, uh, or what else we see? This is part of the training. The same with uh, testing of source code. It's training. That's what it is. It is not a governance tool for me. No. It's just training. Yeah. Yes, and then the other role that exists, and uh, we are also doing this in FARA, is to create the security champion or security engineer in each one of the teams. So as you saw in that picture, the, the, the configuration of the team, each team in Visma is assigned to a, with a security engineer. So this person, it's more responsible for influencing the development team to focus on security or bring up, oh, guys, you have to think about security now. Or if you are going to implement a new feature, then say, like, okay, we have to think of all aspects of security here and so on. Uh, building the development team trust and especially also coaching everyone in the team. So then it's also kind of like the anchor from uh, the, develop the te security testing, security team and the, the development team as well. And this is something that uh, it's working. In, uh, usually I also ask them, they usually ask, uh, use about 25% of their time on doing this role as a security engineer. And a part of the political gambit here is that I, of course I wanted a full-time person in each team, uh, but I had to put in as about 10%. That was about the, what management could afford. But I can see that your research now is at 25%, so I'm, yay, <laughs> very happy uh, about that. Uh, and also the name security engineer was chosen with purpose in the Nordics because security engineer was easy to attract people to. Security champion was difficult to attract people to. That's at least the answers I got from people. Yeah, so the security champion as a role, is, it comes more from the OASP. So OASP also preached that we should have security champions in each one of the teams. And uh, I, I'm actually using more as a security champion, and Aspen is using more as a security engineer. So, yeah. And then there is the security maturity index that Alexander talked about. Yeah, we have two slides on the index. Yeah. And uh, basically, uh, each of their services. So she has been gracious enough to erase the names of them. <laughs> you don't have to. I don't care if you, if you share these things. But in essence, the, the, these are names of products that you will find out in the market. So management has placed them in a required tier. This tier has requirements associated with it. So for instance, if you're in gold, you have to do manual security testing every year. You have to do analysis of source code. You have to do all of these things. You can still choose your own method for doing that. But some of them I buy and I have over a central budget, so they are free. You can use them if you want, but if you have some money extra, you can do whatever you please. I don't mind. So if you learn me something new, I'm just happy and I can implement that on scale later on. So these, all of these are superstars, I guess. They are required on gold and they're performing on platinum, so they're overperforming currently. Mm -hmm. um, one of the findings that we have had on this is that um, this transparency that this creates, it is crucial, actually, because the teams are then stacking themselves up against each other and they are measuring themselves and they are getting used to the fact that people are looking in their cards. Uh, and if I allow teams to uh, compartmentalize, put themselves in silos, uh, they can hide their deficiencies from themselves, actually, because that's what, who they're hiding from. So by knowing this, if I go to the next one, you will see more details. Uh, okay, I think I remember the service here now. So the, uh, you can see the manual tests, um, older than 12 months, yes, no points on that. This one only scores 131 points. So we have a negative kind of reinforcement system here. I'm not very proud of it, but that was what I was able to, to create <laughs> right now. So I think the, the worst case scenario in, in some of the teams is about 60,000 points. I call them the toxic waste department. Uh, and these ones are very good, the ones with very low scores. Um, so it's quite simple to see for stakeholders. They have this simple trend line to negotiate. So if this spikes a lot, then they ask question to the service owner who is the one who makes all decisions. Mm. So if they see that this, um, this bar is going up, that means that maybe they don't have enough people, not enough resources, the developers might need some more training, need some new tools. Uh, that means that the service 
owner and the security engineer can always have an explanation for why. So we try to measure as much as we can and provide this as a dashboard for all teams to use at their own discretion. I do not follow this up every day because I don't make decisions for the teams. I try to help the ones who are in the toxic waste department and I try to show off the ones on the top tier. So this is the behavior I want to reinforce. The other ones we try to help. So then I know where to focus. Uh, one, one interesting thing about this maturity index is that focus on some things that also in FAR I'm doing is that focus on static analysis tools onboarding, focus on the automated uh, vulnerability dependency checking, uh, also on the manual testing, but at least like once a year, and also in doing this gap analysis of where you are on security and where you should be. You know, so then you can implement in different ways, but the concepts I think that drives the most of the points are these ones. Yeah. Yeah, and then there is everyone else in the team that is, uh, they should be investigating all the problems and looking at all the problems that they may be putting on the system every day. So then every time you write something, it may be a possibility that you are also including a vulnerability, the same way that you may, be, may have a possibility that you are including a defect. And in that is that uh, Visma has uh, chosen uh, Coverity as one of the tools to, to use, but like different companies use different tools. And what is more important about this is that each team can decide the process around it. So then like, for example, in FARA, we do like, some teams decide to, to run it every Sunday, some, to, some teams are running every day, some teams are running once a month, and then it depends a lot on the context and what you are doing also on the project. So sometimes they are not developing new, new features, so then I relax a little bit and say like, okay, you can run every month if you don't want to run every day or every week and so on. But if they are developing a new system, then I ask them to, to improve a little bit on that and run every day, for example. Yeah. The only thing I would like to do, well, two things I would like to highlight when you do things like this, um, it is that if you feel the call to make decisions on behalf of development teams, please refrain from doing that. Because the development team is the ones who owns the context. So if I just use this tool and search for examples of MD5 hashes in code to ask someone, then I tried to do that actually in the beginning, but I found out that I was being called stupid because I was actually stupid. Because the existence of MD5 does not mean that the security feature is dependent on it. So it's only in the context where the MD5 is being used for a security function that it is a vulnerability. And then the, it's the only one to know that is the team itself. So therefore all decisions of prioritization of these tickets has to be done on team context. It cannot be done by outsiders. So therefore we rely on the teams to use these tools responsibly. So therefore it was translated into a training uh, tool as opposed to being a governance tool, as it could have been. Mm. And then another tool that I, I think it's very important to have is also to check the dependencies that you have in the system and if the, those libraries or dependencies ha components have some known vulnerabilities. And with that information, they can decide if you're going to upgrade the, the version or if you're going to change or if you're going to, ch to use another one. And there are different tools to use. And um, yeah, issues some, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and our time is almost over, I but that's the last <laughs> slide. <laughs> uh, yeah, so then the question again, can security become a routine? I think so, but as like, I, I think, I hope I left this clear that we need to have a leadership on it. We have to, to have a clear roles and responsibilities around security to make it work. And if you don't have that, security goes out of the window because then you just like focus on the functionality, focus on doing the things and testing and so on, but you, you lose the focus of security and you end up not doing. Because we are all in a rush, we are always doing things to get output of functionalities out there, and then we need to have someone that is focusing on that and leading this part in the, in the project. I do agree with, uh, with Daniela, and I'm looking forward to deploying bug bounties and all the things on the teams, that's the next big thing for us. So I'm really looking forward to exposing all of our teams to the lovely hackers that we love so much. Uh, and this is gonna be a fun um, 2019, I guess. Yeah. It's gonna be expensive, but it's gonna be fun. <laughs> so everybody who wants to join in, come hack us, have fun. 
We have a responsible disclosure program for that. Okay, so thank you.